Hi, my name is Amanda Panacea, and you're listening to the Healer Revolution podcast. This is a community for self-healers, biohackers, practitioners, and any other helping professionals. You're in the right place if you're seeking conversations about how pain becomes passion, the connection between physical, energetic, mental, and our spiritual self, finding your body's ancient wisdom, the latest biohacking technologies, clinical research, and if you just want to nerd out about complex biochemistry and quantum physics. But this is also for entrepreneurs who seek infinite abundance and a supportive community. So pour a cup of King Coffee or Sistus Tea and let's join the revolution. Hello and welcome to the Healer Revolution podcast. I am your host, Amanda Panacea. And today I have the pleasure of introducing a really incredible human being that I met through the internet. His name is Ben Ahrens, and he is the founder of the Reorigin program, which is a neuroplasticity based program. Now, Ben has a really incredible story. He was diagnosed with chronic neurological Lyme for many, many years at the age, starting at the age of 25. And this all happened despite living a very healthy and active lifestyle. He was a semi-professional surfer, a trainer, and an athlete. And eventually he found himself completely debilitated and really unable to function until he came across neuroplasticity. So through his journey, not only just learning about what neuroplasticity is, and then also meeting with several neuroscientists and cutting edge doctors from all around the world, he eventually was able to make a full recovery. And he reports that he has remained 100% healed for over 10 years now. Now he's taken everything that he's learned as well as what these other neuroscientists have taught him and created this re-origin program, which is also community-based. So no matter what type of condition you're suffering from, if it's chronic uh, symptoms, nervous system, trauma, Lyme, mold, whatever the case may be, his program is going to be beneficial for you. So I really hope you enjoy our conversation. He is one of those people I could have just kept talking to and asking questions for hours and hours. He really blew me away with how brilliant he is, and I hope you like it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Healer Revolution podcast. I am your host, Amanda Panacea, and I'm really excited for my guest today. His name is Ben Ahrens, and he has a really incredible journey of healing from Lyme, and now he has a business that he has geared towards like neuroplasticity and helping others heal from all sorts of chronic conditions. So hi, Ben. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to hear your whole story. So for those listening, Ben has a TED Talk, but it's pretty short. So I'm excited to kind of get the long form of how you got sick and then how you recovered as well. So the floor is all yours. Yeah, sure. So we can actually pick it up there. Let's say the TED Talk, I was given an eight minute time slot. This was uh, Mm, over five years ago now, (laughs) you know, and of course they ask you these questions when you're formulating your talk, like, okay, in eight minutes, you know, what's the one thing you can share with someone? that's like the most impactful, most pivotal. It's like, all right, well, trying to consolidate a lifetime of experience into a short talk. But, you know, I will say that uh, kind of like comes into the middle and I'm today I can share a little bit, you know, what happened in more detail, what led to my own transformational experience of healing and recovery and how I kind of got into what I'm doing now. So, you know, maybe I'll just start off by by sharing a little bit of background that in the past, in my early 20s, getting out of school, I worked in the health and fitness industry. I was just really passionate about the human body and how it could change as well as just, as just health and performance. Um, I was an athlete myself, a traveling surfer, and had a, a surf camp in Eastern Long Island. And then in my mid-20s, I got really sick with, as you mentioned, chronic Lyme disease turned out to be a case that was left unaddressed or unidentified for many years. And when that happens, it can sometimes make its way into the central nervous system and kind of wreak havoc on all of these other organs and systems in the body. And a lot of people end up with strange symptoms and diagnoses of things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and and POTS. And these are all really just descriptive diagnoses. They're not really 
you know, definitions in and of themselves. And they certainly don't tell you much about what's going on in your body or let alone, you know, how to, how to fix it. So this was the case for me and it landed me in, in, uh, you know, bed for about three years while I was trying to parse through this, trying to recover it first and remain patient, but then, you know, step forward and see all these different doctors. And ultimately one of the key learning moments I remember having was actually what became the title of my, my Ted talk, which is called one deep breath which was when I was uh, experiencing a lot of symptoms, brain fog, fatigue, migrating aches and pains, weird things that would just shift around the body. In one moment of maybe sort of panic, I, I took this like really deep breath and let out this sigh of relief. And for the first time in a couple of years, right on the other side of that exhalation, I found a little space of peace for maybe like half a second, right? And then it was gone. But something stayed with me from that. I realized that, okay, even in the midst of this discomfort, this pain, this agitation, and the emotional turmoil of thinking that, you know, you're, you're, you'll never be able to do the things that you wanted to do in life. Even in that midst, I could find, I still had access to something on a much deeper level. And in that moment, I remember it felt like it was the one thing that I could control. It was like, I, there was nothing else in my life that I could control. Couldn't control symptoms or doctor's reports or anything like that. But I could control if I chose to take this one deep breath. And every time I did that, it seemed that what would follow was this little space of of sort of peace. And that space gradually started to get longer and longer. The more I practiced this gave me a little bit more cognitive bandwidth back. And I just, I, I remember finding that fascinating that there was some, you know, perceptual thing going on that was actually making me feel better and allowing my body to even have a little bit more energy than it had, um, you know, prior. And um, so this led me down the road of, um, you know, studying the mind and the brain and how the mind and body work together, led me to uh, listening to audiobooks I, I couldn't read at the time, but um, taking courses and listening to things like Norman Doidge, the brain that changes itself, and ultimately learning about neuroplasticity, which is the field that studies uh, the brain's ability to change. And because I felt incredibly stuck during that time, as anyone who's struggled with anxiety or a chronic condition could, could probably relate learning that actually we're not stuck. Actually, the brain and body are constantly able to change themselves was a very hopeful thing for me. So I just kind of went in that direction, you know, pulling at the thread of hope. And there I learned different exercises, how we could expand from just doing a simple thing like taking a breath to actually, you know, working your brain in a very similar way that you would work your body when you're trying to condition it to say, learn a new physical skill or develop new physical attributes, um, that the brain is actually very similar and it responds to conditioning. So long story short, uh, many years of, of learning and applying and, and trial and error, I eventually did resume full health, went to work in Manhattan for a medical company that was doing seminars in biological medicine for about eight years and just met and was able to study with extraordinary practitioners of, of neuroscience and osteo osteo paths and MDs and NDs and all these different disciplines coming together. And I was just kind of like a sponge soaking it up. In the beginning of the pandemic, a good friend of mine from, from the past who had had an, an adjacent healing and recovery journey herself reached out to me with this, you know, idea to start a, a neuroplasticity company. You know, she also experienced the, the incredible benefits of the brain and and using things like brain training. So we've since started, uh, you know, a program called Reorigin, which basically walks people through step by step how they can use what's called target or, or self-directed neuroplasticity to change the way that their brain and body respond to stress and to tilt the scales a little bit more in the favor of healing and recovery. Awesome. That's yeah. Incredible. Thank you for sharing. And one thing that I thought was really important for people to know is just how sick you were. Like this wasn't just you started having anxiety and joint pain. Like you were completely bed bound for a long time and not able to function. Is that correct? Yeah. And I had, you know, very, um, a lot of times when people are sick with a chronic condition, one of the major frustrations is that they go to the doctor and they do blood workups and everything. And the doctor said, well, you look fine, you know, and person knows that they're not feeling fine. And it was definitely the case that my perception or how I felt did not align with what 
uh, tests and studies were showing, but it was also the case for me that um, I had very real, you know, very, very measurable symptoms are always real, I say, but in this case, very, um, you know, measurable through common instrumentation uh, damage in the body, things like bone on bone arthritis in the knees and elbows, things like um, multiple brain lesions in the frontal cortex, you know, things that are not supposed to heal, (laughs) things that are said to be irreversible by conventional standards. And the kicker is, of course, you know, years later after a lot of changes that I, that I had made. When I went back for clinical testing, they rescanned my brain, they rechecked my you know, joints and tissue and blood work and everything. And um, not only had everything returned to normal, meaning joint tissue had regenerated, brain lesions were gone, but when they checked my blood for antibodies and things like that of past infection, uh, it actually looked like I had never been sick in the first place. And, um, so this was like a radical, you know, transformation and just sparked my curiosity further of like, whoa, how can, how can the brain (laughs) have this kind of impact on the physical body? Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. And people ask me all the time, can, is brain retraining, is the nervous system work enough to heal Lyme? And I'm like, yes, there are so many examples and you're an amazing example of that as well. Like you can definitely recover from anything just with changing your mind, your belief systems, working on the nervous system. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the body is a really intricate system. It's a system of, of self-organization and, and balance. And one of the things I learned when I was working with these different doctors after, you know, my, my experience in biological medicine is that the pathogen or the thing that's coming at us from the outside, whether it's a pathogen, like a, you know, Lyme bacteria or, um, or mold or EMF or whatever it might be is only one side of the equation. The other side is how and why your body responds to that thing. And what sits in the middle in between those two things is the brain. It's the nervous system. It's that is the central processing unit that basically perceives information, you know, and the information can be pathogens, can be, you know, anything else, but it perceives anything coming in from the environment and it determines what sort of response your immune system, your inflammatory processes, all of these systems in the body should have. And because we now know that through things like functional MRIs and, and you know, self-directed neuroplasticity, we can change the way the brain processes information. That means that sort of through a, a secondary route, we can actually change the way our immune system responds. Yeah, that's one of the biggest lessons of my life, I think, because I always had like tons of allergies growing up and I just assumed, well, I hit the the jackpot for being allergic to all these things and then realizing and learning about the nervous system taught me that the nervous system work you'll, you'll do will change your immune system functioning, which just like opened up a huge can of worms. So (laughs) yeah, uh, I would love if you can kind of go into like prior to you getting sick, this is just something that interests me personally. Do you, did you have any big triggers for like looking back on getting sick or like, what was your perfect storm before that happened? Yeah, you know, I, I, I sort of have come to realize that for, for me, the the lime was the straw that broke the camel's back, but mm-hmm. the camel's back might not have broken if it wasn't carrying a heavy load of other things. So then the question, I think, you know, what you're asking is, well, what contributed to that total load, yeah. right? And we all have stuff going on. You know, we all have past experiences, exposures, and, you know, I think the the human being can handle an incredible amount of stress. And I'm using the word stress in a very general and all encompassing way to include things like pathogens, you know, infections. We come in contact with little things here and there every day, and we don't all get sick from them. And also, you know, psychological stress and emotional stress and past traumas and things from the environment and, you know, EMFs or whatever it else, you know, might be. And we know that it's important, like, to understand how the body reacts to that, because if it was just the pathogen or if it was just the the EMF or just the mold, then necessarily everyone who got exposed to that same thing would have the exact same reaction. The interesting thing is that you can have like a hundred different people or a hundred different patients with the same condition, but they're all like expressing it totally differently, right? So yeah, I think I think whenever you look at at someone's uh, story of how they got ill and how they got well, you have to look at 
who is that entire person? What were all of their experiences that makes them who they are? And certainly for me, you know, I was carrying a, a lot of stress. I don't know how far you want me to go back, but um, we all have have stuff going on, like in our past and childhoods. But I definitely felt like my nervous system was very wound up very tight. I remember this very distinctly in my, especially in my early twenties, you know, getting out of college, trying to figure out what my next moves were and just, you know, kind of over exerting myself, overworking myself, training as an athlete, then training other people who were athletes or people recovering from, from injuries. Then I was running a surf camp in the summers in Eastern Long Island and, you know, doing things that were very physically, very intellectually just demanding on a lot of levels. And certainly, you know, begs the question, well, why was I doing all of that? Some elements of, you know, trying to prove myself or establish myself in the world. And, you know, so there was a lot of different things I think going on. Also, I'll say that I'm sure that I had Lyme in my system since childhood. My sister and I grew up in Eastern Long Island and we were, you know, picking ticks off each other as kids. And uh, I had had even symptoms in my late childhood and early teens of neck pain and joint stiffness and pain in, in the bottom of the feet, which are, are now being recognized as more like indicative of, of a Lyme infection. Back then, like, again, my my young physiology could stave, stave these things off for a long time. But when all of these things came together and you use the, the word perfect storm, I think that that describes the scenario really well. You know, when the stress and the sleepless nights combined with perhaps the pre-existing infection combined with the psychological stress. Um, and then I went on a trip to West Africa um, where I picked up a parasite and was being very physically active on this trip. It was a surfing trip that I think kind of like created too much stress at one time so that it overloaded the body, overwhelmed the nervous system. And that was like flipping a light switch for me. It was like from one day to the next, I was you know, I was good to go. And then the next day I was very not good. Yeah. Yeah. And I hear that from quite a few people as well. They were managing, handling, and then all of a sudden, bam, body just went into severe illness and they never really recovered. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is interesting. And um, I actually remember there was one like seminar I went to part of biological medicine, but they were looking at all of these different illnesses and conditions and associating them with personality types. And it's not to say that one causes the other, right? It's not to say that, okay, if you have perfectionism or something like you're going to get Lyme, nothing like that, but there are interesting correlations. And I certainly see it now working with, you know, a lot of people who are going through different types of conditions. Many of us seem to be sort of type A, a little bit of a chip on the shoulder. We got something to prove, right? And it, it kind of makes sense on an intuitive level. It's like, okay, if you feel that way, then you're kind of not fully relaxed or fully, you know, it's not easy to totally disengage. You're always kind of tightening a little bit. And from a neuroscience perspective, we know that that tightening sensation actually sends the body or signals the brain into more of a fight or flight or sympathetic state, which prompts it to kind of reallocate its energetic resources away from things like long-term healing, wound healing, digestion, immune function, and apply it to dealing with what it sees as like the more immediate challenge. So I think the, the you know, there's something to be said for these kind of understanding who you are, what your history is and learning about yourself. That's a yeah. huge part of the process. Yeah, I think so many of us can resonate with that feeling like you have something to prove can also go back to self-worth and self-love. If you don't feel like you're worthy, if you feel like you have to do A, B, and C to be worthy, then on a subconscious level, you may not be truly even relaxed because you're yeah. still resisting who you truly are on some level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, when you and I had a first chat a few weeks ago, we talked about this idea of like alignment, right? And kind of, mm -hmm. kind of being in alignment with what you're doing, with how you're spending your time, with how you're behaving. And, you know, so I think so much of the time, so many of us are not fully in alignment and it's something really hard to first and foremost become aware of. And then, you know, okay, well, how do I realign myself? And that I think is the gift of going through a challenging experience like a, like an illness or a chronic condition is that it really, I don't like to use the word forces, but it invites you, I'll say yeah. too, <laughs> right? To kind of look at yourself in a bigger context and learn to look at yourself lovingly. And yeah, you know, it's, again, it's, it's, it's nice to think generally about, oh, loving thoughts and positive thinking and all this kind of stuff. But now with like the neuroscience coming into the picture, we're like, oh, actually when 
when you are in that state, what we would describe as alignment or this feeling of ease that actually does, you know, put you into a more parasympathetic state, which we now know is really optimized for healing and recovery. Yeah. And I find that a lot of people, they have a lot of the people pleasing and fawning tendencies. They have a much harder time with this because it's very difficult to figure out who you really are. If you are abandoning your, if you learn to abandon yourself at a young age, usually because of survival to attune Mm -hmm. to everyone else around you. And so even though you may be fantastic at caregiving and being friends with people and, you know, maybe even in your job as like a coach or a therapist, it's harder to connect with that, like true authenticity. And it definitely takes some practice. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And I think one of the things that, that's interesting, though, is and, and it's very true what you said that I think a lot of you know people have uh, like have put others before themselves or are in this sort of you know have been in that sort of caretaker role or or mindset. And the interesting thing is is that I think there's a lot that we can export from that and import into applying that same energy toward ourselves. You know, um, we kind of learn to look at ourselves in our situation a little bit objectively and then be our own caretaker, send that that love and that nourishing energy and, and support uh, where, where, where it's needed and not feel, feel guilty about it. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like, you know, there's a lot of talk about abundance and tapping into abundance, but there is, uh, you know, something to be said for being in a, in a sort of more scarcity type of experience. And when you're in, you know, fight or flight, it can certainly feel like we have this finite ledger of energy. And if I, you know, give to myself as to say, you know, add a plus one to to my column, then I necessarily have to add a minus one to your column. It means I have to take from you and give to me. Or if I give to someone else, I have to subtract from myself and give to them. And I think what we start to learn is as we shift into this more relaxed state is that energy is actually abundant. We have an insane amount of energy coming through us, coming to us, and that we can, you know, we can actually just access it. And that me giving to you doesn't take away from the energy and the the chemical processes and things that are happening within me. Oh, I love how you explain that. That is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a journey that we're all, I think, figuring out as we go. Yeah, definitely. Have you had to give up coffee for health? health reasons. Maybe because of the stress it was putting on your adrenals. Maybe because it was messing with your sleep. Maybe because you felt terrible after drinking it. Or maybe because you were told coffee had mold on the beans and you needed to stay away from mold. Well, what if I told you there's an organic, mycotoxin-free, quality coffee that contains reishi spores or Ganoderma lucidum? Ganoderma lucidum helps to modulate your immune system, adapt to stress, balance hormones, and doesn't give you the jitters or shakes like regular coffee used to. Sounds too good to be true, right? It's called King Coffee by the company Organo. And King Coffee came into my life when I was struggling with chronic hives, full body eczema, and mast cell activation syndrome. I hadn't drank coffee in years because it made me feel anxious, shaky, and clammy. So I had no expectations that drinking King Coffee would be any different. However, I decided to give it a try after seeing lots of amazing practitioners talk about the benefits of reishi online. I tried a seven-day sample and the chronic hives were gone by day five. I was in shock. After that, I dove into the research on reishi and found that there are over 3,000 peer-reviewed PubMed clinical trials using reishi Ganoderma as an intervention. The company Organo also has a patent protected on their harvesting process. They double crack open the spore shells, which makes them up to 80% more potent than the body of the reishi, which is usually used in other reishi products. This also makes the spores 90% more bioavailable for your body to use. If you would like to try King Coffee, visit thehealerrevolution.myorganogold.com or for a seven-day trial, you can check out my link tree on my Instagram at Amanda Panacea. So let's get into a little more about like the actual science of neuroplasticity and how this works. In your TED Talk, you said a really amazing quote, which I want to repeat correctly. So I wrote it down. But you said the first rule of defensive driving is to never look at what you're trying to avoid. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I think just kind of explains neuroplasticity really well, or at least 
one of the goals of neuroplasticity. But if you have some nice sciencey language, could you kind of explain what neuroplasticity is and how it works? Yeah, sure. So neuroplasticity is basically your brain's ability to change its structure and its function. So previously they thought that the brain was static, stopped changing and stopped growing new brain cells at a certain age. And they now know that that's completely untrue throughout our entire lives. It's growing new brain cells process called neurogenesis, and it's changing its synaptic connections. And in fact, if it wasn't the case that it was doing that, we wouldn't actually be able to learn anything new. Every time we make a habit, break a habit, or learn a new skill or a new language, or even see a new face, we are literally changing the structure and the function of our brain. So why is this important? Well, the brain has certain habits and behaviors the same way that we do, the same way that we you know, can develop routines and kind of automatically go through our morning routine. The brain's number one priority is survival and its number two priority is efficiency. So what that means is that it's always in an effort to conserve energy, it's consolidating memories and neural pathways so that it can you know, deploy a certain pattern in the future. Let's say you know, if you were learning to catch a baseball, at first you might miss it a bunch of times, you have to learn where you're arm is in space and everything. But once you learn it, you get it really ingrained in your brain and, and body is what we know as muscle memory. Now I can throw a baseball your way and your arm will just almost seemingly instinctively reach out and grab it. And that's because the brain no longer has to go through, oh, ball, you know, put out my hand, you know, it doesn't have to go through all of the steps involved when you were learning it. It's consolidated those steps into a singular action. And it's changed its neuronal structure to create a little like process that allows you to do that really quickly. And it does this with all kinds of things. So, you know, one study that was really interesting was back in the 70s, they did a study and wrote a paper called Conditioned Immune Suppression, where they gave rats an injection with a pathogen. I think it was a viral infection with a little bit of dextrose solution. And as you would suspect, the rats had an immune reaction. After they did this a few times, they then gave the rats the injection of just sugar water. So no trace of a pathogen. And Similarly here, the rats still had the same immune reaction because their brain and immune system actually had sort of memorized what's called an immune reflex. They now associated the act of getting this injection with, you know, these subconscious, uh, deeply unconscious actions that the body has. And so why neuroplasticity is so important where this comes into play is that when we've been struggling with something for a long time, whether it's anxiety, whether it's even a physical condition, there's a part of the brain that essentially learns to overprotect the body. This goes back to that first order of business of the brain, which is to keep us safe. And because it wants to make things more efficiently again, like it's doing that, you know, absent of our conscious mind. But once we become aware of this, and now with certain exercises or tools, we can actually start to you know, intervene. And so one of the ways that we do this is by redirecting our awareness onto different aspects of the environment or of our body that create a different feeling, create a different chemical reaction within us. So, you know, getting back to that quote, never look at what you're trying to avoid, kind of where that comes in and, and ties into this is that your brain is always taking in information from the environment. And because there's way too much information coming in, then we're able to process in any given moment, the brain has to use something called salience, which is its ability to filter out what it thinks is like the relevant information. Kind of like, you know, if the same way that you can have a conversation with one person in a really crowded room where other noise and other people are talking, the brain has this ability to like pick out a signal through the noise. Now, because the brain has evolved what's called a negativity bias or its pref you know, preference to focus on things that it thinks it needs to focus on in order to keep you safe, it preferentially often will pick out information that it has detected or at least classified as being a potential threat, even if it's not a threat. And this goes back to you know evolutionary biology of just how the brain evolved when we were on the sub-Saharan African plains and you know being chased by the lion, all of these kind of examples that work very well in these acute settings. But now it might interpret something like a sensation or an emotion or an experience or an anticipation of an experience like public speaking or something, it might actually, the brain can associate those things too with threats, even though they're actually not life-threatening. But because it's made that connection, the um, the body will actually start to respond as if they are life-threatening, keeping us in fight or flight, 
producing inflammatory cytokines and basically, you know, kicking us down the road of ill health or not, you know, further away from, from well-being. So by applying this first rule of defensive driving, I know this is sort of a long-winded explanation, That's but by perfect. applying the first rule of defensive driving and withdrawing our attention from the things that we ultimately want to avoid and placing it on something that's more positive, we are retraining the brain's negativity bias. We are taking control over that salience network and we're teaching the brain, actually, you don't have to be focused on these seeming threats all the time. You can actually be focused on a much broader spectrum of reality. You can be focused on the beauty out there. And it's not, you know, I just want to differentiate this from positive thinking, um, or as most people think of positive thinking, which is just, you know, the, the idea of like willing it or ignoring problems or just thinking your way better or something like that. It's quite different from that. Instead, what it is, it's acknowledging the signals coming in from one end say, okay, Sure, it might be true that I, I'm experiencing this unpleasant thought or feeling or emotion or sensation or symptom. But at the same time, it's also true that it's a beautiful day out and that, you know, there's a beautiful green uh, scene or grass behind me and that, you know, um, there's a much broader spectrum of experience that's available to me. And by practicing redirecting our awareness onto those other things, we can actually retrain the brain to default this calm state where it's no longer on high alert, looking for threats. And we can, as a result, feel calm, peaceful, at ease, and just in a better place for healing to take place. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And uh, with that quote in mind, the first thing I thought of was when you first start to get sick and you kind of go down the rabbit hole of, you know, what is Lyme disease or what is mold? What can it do? And you follow all these accounts and then you start to read and listen to podcasts and your whole life becomes consumed with trying to figure out or fix what's going on with you. But at the same time, your whole life becomes consumed with like reinforcing that you are sick and then it can escalate and just you know, keep your brain thinking on those topics over and over and over again. And I think this is where a lot of people get stuck in trying to, you know, go after parasites, go after Lyme, go after mold. And it just seems never ending because there's uh, the way that they're thinking is constantly in that negativity bias of like, something's wrong, got to fix it, got to do the next thing, got to do the next thing. And a, such a big part of healing for most people is finally getting out of that limbic loop and finding like a program like yours or some other type of neuroplasticity and nervous system work and maybe even trauma work so that they can finally like get out of that loop of thoughts and working on going towards more positivity, like you said, and figuring out who they are and aligning with all the things that they love again. And I remember in your TED talk, you mentioned you replaced like all of your lab data and all your doctors and research with surfing stuff again and things that made you happy and things that aligned with your goals that you had for yourself. Yeah. And that was a, you know, I, I did take a very literal interpretation of the, <laughs> the defensive driving quote of like, don't like actually don't look at what you're trying to avoid. And the opposite of that would be focus on what you're trying to go toward. And so you're right. Yeah. I had a lot of these scary things in my room and had all of these, you know, papers and journals and stuff printed out with scary information on it. And, and so this single decision was one of the biggest pivot points in my healing and recovery journey was deciding to look, really just look toward where I wanted to go. And yeah, so I replaced, as you mentioned, like all of the scary stuff in my room, the IV pole, the, all the stuff that made it look like a hospital room with, you know, surf gear and basically gave my mind the impression that I was getting ready to go on a surf trip, even though it would still be seven years from that day. I remember doing that before I would actually get back in, into traveling and surfing, but it's the orientation that matters. It's the direction that matters. And that was a massive pivot point that sent me down a new direction. And, you know, later as I've come to understand this stuff from a neuroscience perspective, the information that comes in through the visual field, through our eyes, is some of the most powerful and most prioritized information that the brain processes in its hierarchy of all the information that comes in through the senses. And one of the interesting things that I started to learn is that when the body, you know, reacts in a certain way or produces certain chemicals that we know are, you know, our feelings or affect the way we, we function, it doesn't only respond or react to what's happening. It actually reacts to what we anticipate will happen. And this is called an anticipatory response. And we know that 
that this works because if anyone right now listening were to vividly imagine their favorite food, let's say like a watermelon or something really delicious on a hot day, you have this salivary response because the body is preparing in anticipation for those nutrients by secreting different chemicals and enzymes to ingest those. We also know that if you anticipate say having a negative interaction with someone or a tough conversation with someone, or we replay, you know, things from the past, doesn't really matter whether it was past or, or future projection, but you're kind of like reliving that experience that's not actually happening now. The brain and body produce the chemicals as if it is happening now. So again, this is called the anticipatory response. So I found that, you know, but the more I researched and read this scary stuff, the more I was anticipating things like I'll never get, it doesn't only respond or react to what's happening. Happening. It actually reacts to what we anticipate will happen. And this is called an anticipatory response. And we know that this works because if anyone right now listening were to vividly imagine their favorite food, let's say like a watermelon or something really delicious on a hot day, you have this salivary response because the body is preparing in anticipation for those nutrients by secreting different chemicals and enzymes to ingest those. We also know that if you anticipate say having a negative you know interaction with someone or a tough conversation with someone or we replay you know things from the past it doesn't really matter whether it was past or, or future projection but you're kind of like reliving that experience that's not actually happening now the brain and body produce the chemicals as if it is happening now. So again, this is called the anticipatory response. So I found that, you know, but the more I researched and read this scary stuff, the more I was anticipating things like I'll never get better. And, you know, this is only going to get worse. And I was anticipating feeling bad. And that has a sort of chemical consequence that makes it more easy to feel bad. On the other hand, if I anticipated, you know, feeling good, feeling at ease, you know, then it's not to say it would happen or make a shift overnight, but could it tilt the scales in that direction? You know, could it lead to a trend that is more favorable for creating the conditions in which health can, can come about? And the answer is uh, most certainly it can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned your journey, seven years it took to kind of recover. And before we started, I called you one of the OGs in the neuroplasticity space, <laughs> because this you've been at this for a very long time. And I was just wondering, what are some of your, one of the, some of your mentors, maybe some of the books or uh, resources that you found? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So actually my, from the moment I really started to get into the, the brain retraining stuff, I, I saw significant recovery in about eight to 10 months. And then there was additional retraining, but right after that, I got, I got really immersed and absorbed in this world of biological medicine and integrative medicine. And so I ended up working in full time, you know, full time in, in midtown Manhattan. And so, yeah, it would still be you know, set, uh, six or seven years from that point oh, before okay. I took my first trip, but there was healing, you know, ongoing healing taking place all along the way. One of the pivotal books for me was certainly Norman Doidge, The Brain That Changes Itself. That's what kind of I remember made me go from feeling really stuck to understanding that the brain and body are in a constant state of change and that we can kind of tap into and help guide the direction into which that change proceeds. So strong recommend there. In terms of, of mentor mentors, there was a few you know doctors, the clinic I was working with in this organization was called Innovative Medicine. And the, the head doctor there at the time, his name was uh, Dr. Schultz. I remember he said, that the role of a doctor should not be to perpetually manage sick patients. Instead, it should be to reestablish a patient's ability to self-manage. And I remember that that was something that always really stuck with me because there's a lot packed into that sentiment. It kind of implies that the body has this innate ability to self-manage and to self-heal. And that our role, whether it's as you know practitioner or a coach or the person who's looking to get better, is not to make the healing happen. Instead, it's more like the role of a farmer, right? The farmer doesn't make the seeds grow. He just sets the right conditions. He plants them in healthy soil, makes sure they have plenty of sunlight and water, and just through setting the stage in the right way, allows them to do what they naturally do. So I think understanding, you know, biological medicine, um, studying people like Dr. Thomas Rao, who has a clinic in, in Switzerland called Paracelsus, and Paracelsus himself, who is sort of a grandfather of biological medicine, was a huge impact on me. But these guys are really all saying, you know, a similar thing, which is that the body's innate ability is to self-heal. And if we can just set the right conditions and then kind of back off, <laughs> it will, you know, allow it to do its thing, maybe guide it a little bit here and there, that it will resume this natural 
capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Surrender instead of trying to control was a big theme for me (laughs) also. Totally. Yeah. One more, uh, you know, I should mention is is, uh, Dr. David Hawkins, who's an MD, PhD. This was an interesting guy who's knew very early on in life that his mission was to alleviate, you know, human suffering. And so early on, he became a medical doctor studying uh, anesthesiology, basically with the best of intention, but thinking that, okay, well, suffering is caused by pain. If I can, you know, eliminate the pain with anesthesia, suffering gone. And what he found was that, well, he could, you know, modulate pain in certain ways with that. It really did very little. Uh, for people who are experiencing suffering, which is something else. That led him into psychiatry. He went back to school, got a degree in psychiatry, and basically now set out with the assumption that suffering takes place in the mind. And so he did everything he could to alleviate that and then found out that even that couldn't really do the full job. It actually takes place on a much deeper level. And this is more, you know, in later in life, he, he went down the road of spirituality and, you know, helping helping people to basically let go and to align with their, their purpose and things like that. But he describes it so well as like, you know, healing is kind of like letting a cork go at the bottom of the ocean. You don't have to struggle or push your way to the top. You just let go and rise to the surface in virtue of your own innate buoyancy. Oh, that's a great quote. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, now I'd like to ask a few questions on how your business structure works and how people can get involved in your program. You said it is a like a platform, a program. Is it how long is it and who can join it? Yeah. So it's a, you know, a community based platform. Anyone can join and basically there they'll find a self guided uh, neuroplasticity video course. It's about six sections. It's about six or seven hours in total, but broken down into very easy to use, um, you know, five minute bite-sized videos that guide you through understanding the role of the brain in various conditions. And these are conditions like Lyme disease, post-viral fatigue or post-COVID, fibromyalgia, chronic pain or pain syndrome. A lot of these things that are, you know, challenging for conventional medicine to really understand because they have to do with the brain, the nervous system, and this entire, you know, system that we call the human body, not just one thing. So people will go through and take this course. They'll learn a series of exercises that they can do to self-modulate or change, you know, the way their body is responding to stress or their specific sensations. And there's also this community aspect, which is really great. So very much in line with that first rule of defensive driving, the community is oriented, not like a support group where we're sharing resources about conditions and things like that, but it's oriented 100% on getting better. So we share, you know, resources that are meant to inspire, keep us going in that direction. We share wins, you know, overcome that uh, learned helplessness you mentioned before with things like the science of small wins. So yeah, it's basically the community that I, I wished I had when I was going through that, where people are cheering each other on, breaking that belief barrier. And I really think one of the hardest parts of healing or beginning the healing journey and kind of the first step is believing that it's possible for you. You know, when you felt stuck for so long and so much of your experience and external world is mirroring back to you or confirming back to you that you are stuck, the hardest part is breaking free of that cycle. And that's really what, you know, having a community is aimed at doing. And yeah, in addition to that, we also have live workshops and events and different guest speakers, whether they're neuroscientists or psychologists or experts of different kinds will come and do Q&A sessions or workshops over Zoom. So it's it's been an exciting journey. We launched this about a year ago. Prior to that, I was doing small group workshops. And prior to that, I was doing individual coaching. But this has just enabled me to scale all of this, you know, stuff that I put together when my own life depended on it, you know, into a way that's easily accessible, organized, and ultimately like actionable for anyone to do. Awesome. So is it like a monthly membership? So it's actually right now, the way we have it set up is people will buy the the neuroplasticity program. It's called You Again. And the company in the, the program is really called Reorigin. So people will just buy that. It's a one-time payment of 300 bucks or 299. So really tried to make it you know as accessible as possible for people who need it. And that will give them lifetime access to the community. So that includes nice. a community forum, weekly Q&A sessions, as well as some of these, you know, guest experts. Now, for those that need a little bit more support or motivation, encouragement, which is helpful to, I would say, most people, we also offer small group coaching. So these are like small cohorts that stay together with the same, you know, people for 12 weeks at a time. So they're really progressive. You all start here together, you finish here together, you go deeper into, you know, certain modules and 
do things like goal setting, accountability. So that's you know ongoing. If if people want, they could do that on a you know month to month or it's really like three month cycles kind of basis. Fantastic. Yeah, that's really affordable. And compared to some of the other brain retraining programs that have been around quite a long time, you also offer that community support, which is different than a lot of other programs. So I will need to check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I really wanted to, this to be different from like, mm-hmm. you know, click buy now and get DVDs in the mail and then you're left yeah. to your own devices, right? It's like, there's humans here <laughs> and people, yeah. that's a, that's abundantly clear the moment people come to our site and they can even sign up for a free info session. It's not a recorded webinar. It's a call with myself, you know, like this. And usually, you know, uh, five or 10 people or so get on and we answer all, all the questions and show people the inside of the program and really just help them determine if this is something that resonates with them, if it's a right fit or a right approach for them. And then if they, if it is, and they get inside the community, they have another, you know, session with a real person, you know, orientation session to help them, you know, navigate this program and, you know, use it in a way that works best with their schedule, condition, personal circumstances. And we're always here. We're available. Awesome. That's amazing. I'm glad that people like you are out there creating platforms like this for so many struggling people. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. I think, you know, the human element is such an important aspect of the healing journey. And I know from my own experience, sometimes just having those people, in in my case, some of those like mentors or people that I came across in, in my healing journey who can see you and just acknowledge you and and just who get it like that's yeah. that's so important yeah and then also of course just see you in a way where sometimes we all need someone else to see potential or things that we might not be able to see ourselves and i honestly believe that every single person as long as you're breathing as long as you're here you absolutely have this healing potential this potential to improve and change your circumstances and i think it sometimes just takes you know other people mirroring that back to you in order for you to let it sink in and take steps on it. Yeah, I completely agree. So I was wondering if you could share some of your like favorite, maybe quick neuroplasticity tips just for maybe like the beginner. Yeah, sure. So we can do a little bit of of an exercise and okay, let's, let's make it a little bit uh, personal here. So we'll make okay. it, um, we'll make it practical. <laughs> is there anything going on? And you don't, you, you know, obviously make it as, as personal or not as, as you want, but if there's anything that's, that's going on, you know, in your life or in your day, that's causing you a little bit of stress or agitation, you can feel free to share that, or you can just think about it in your own mind and anyone listening can do the same thing. Oh yeah, sure. So my biggest symptom is it was, is, and was, I guess, itching. I would say I'm at like 90% better, but I still get itchy here and here and there. I had my hair done on Tuesday and the towel was really wet around my neck. And so I got like a little itchy spot back here. And so brain retraining techniques have been really useful for like shutting down the physical sensa- sensation of itching, but we can use that as an example. Okay. We'll just use that as, as an example for right mm-hmm. now. So you would kind of allow yourself to just bring to mind, you sort of scan your body, see if there's any sensations of of itching. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to imagine that you have those sensations sort of trapped in like, let's say a little bottle, right? Got it. Okay. Now move that bottle from right in front of you to further across the room, but keep it in your peripheral vision. So just maybe it's sitting there on a little shelf in the background. I see okay. it. Well, it's there. Now, at the same time, I want you to bring your awareness to something else that's happening, you know, in your space. And if you want, you can open your eyes. I see that behind you, there's a plant, but maybe there's something in front of you in your visual field that looks interesting or inviting. Okay, got it. Okay. Now... With that little bottle in mind, I want you to focus more deeply on the interesting thing in your visual field now. And you can say what what it is that you're looking at. Some orange glasses. Okay. So I want you to just, you know, tap into any sort of sensation or feeling that those orange glasses might give you. If you, if you think about how interesting they are, like really zoom into it in your mind's eye, you know, focus on the detail. Yeah. They remind me of fun times. Awesome. And go just one step deeper into that. Can you summon up any sort of scene? Maybe these orange glasses are there, but some, remember, anticipation. So we're using positive anticipation here. Any sort of fun experience that involves those glasses? Yes, I can imagine it. Okay. 
Now, put a big smile on your face. And one last time, you're going to take your right hand here and you're just going to move it away from you and touch base with the itchy sensation. Hold out your left hand, touch base with the positive sensations that you get from that scene with the orange glasses and move that hand all the way toward you. Bring it to your chest and smile and just say the word yes. Yes. Good. Okay. All so, right. That was awesome. laughing a little bit giggling. Did you feel anything change from before and after? Yeah. I mean, I immediately thought of, forgot about the itchy spot. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we want to do uh, with brain retraining, this is a sort of distilled, you know, example of, of a type of exercise we could do. But again, we don't want to simply, you know, ignore it because that can signal back to the brain that you know, it's almost like we're suppressing it. We actually want to acknowledge it. We want to expose ourselves to a little bit of it, like you did when you did a body scan, but we want to also put it in proportion. Remember that, uh, you know, the brain will start taking more signals from something the more we focus on it. And Kierkegaard once said that the entire world goes sour if you have a pain in your thumb, right? It's like that one thing is like just coloring everything else. So what we want to do is put it in a little bit of perspective or context and then exercise our freedom to to choose where our awareness goes. You know, we, we all have this ability to choose to take the signals from the painful area or the unpleasant emotion or sensation. At the same time, we are actually free to choose to emphasize or take more signals from a different area of our environment, of our experience, whether it's past or present or future. And by doing that, we are actually already starting to change the brain. We are actually starting to give more neuronal real estate to the things that make you feel pleasant and therefore give less of that space in the brain, you know, to things that make us feel irritated or agitated. So obviously, you know, doing this one time, it's, it's cool that it can change the way you feel in the moment, which is great. But I always like to say, you know, our goal is actually to create a fundamental shift such that it becomes your new default state. And just like any exercise that happens in virtue of repetition and consistency over time. And if you were to practice, you know, something like this, you know, over time, then little by little, those neural pathways would start to shift and the brain would essentially form the new habit of taking less sensations from the itchiness and more sensations from things that are, you know, giving you a positive feeling. So we all can feel, you know, itchy. We all can feel a certain, uh, you know, symptom or sensation, but the way the brain interprets it can ultimately, you know, determine whether it magnifies it or whether it limits it down. And if it limits it down, then this is changing not only our experience, but also the chemistry that, you know, circulates throughout the system. So yeah, just one quick example of something people can play around with, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great example. And for me personally, I like little exercises like that are helpful, but I had learned for so long to shut down listening to my body that it's really helpful for me to say, I hear you, like I'm listening and I'm going to prove that I can, I'm taking care of you. So it was more kind of shifting from that mindset of like, this is wrong. Something's wrong with me. I need to take care of it and fix it right now to I'm proving that I'm taking aligned action and taking care of myself. I'm not going to ignore these sensations anymore. Yeah, exactly. I think that's so key is to give it a little, you know, give it the space that it needs and then, you know, realize that it's a very narrow slip of our total experience or of our, our total reality. And that even, you know, a condition or, or an illness or a challenge that you might be facing, we can then kind of see it for what it is, which is really temporary discomfort in an otherwise long, happy and, and healthy life. And I know mm -hmm. for, for many people, temporary goes on for too long. Certainly it did for me. And for some people, they're struggling with things for 20 years or so. Even in those instances, it still holds true that everything is changing. Nothing is absolutely permanent. And we always have the ability to tune into a greater spectrum of awareness. Yeah. Beautiful. So I have really enjoyed talking with you. I feel like I could just listen to you talk for a very long time. <laughs> um, I'm going to check out your program because it sounds like you have some really amazing tools and a really amazing community that I think almost anyone would be ecstatic to be a part of. So if you have anything else, any last words? Yeah, I just always, you know, would like to leave it off on a, a hopeful note for anyone mm -hmm. out there that might be feeling feeling stuck. If you've been feeling like you've been trying a lot of things and have been met with resistance, I just want to really assure you that you're not actually stuck, that everything in your brain and body is absolutely capable of change. In fact, change is your nature. And through some relatively simple things that you can anyone can learn to do, you can really become the sort of author as to which direction 
that change proceeds. Yeah, we we see you, we hear you. And um, for anyone interested, of course, you know, there's the Reorigin program out there, which can be found at reorigin.com, just spelled out re-origin.com. And yeah, always, always like to hear other stories and here to support anyone on their journey back to health. Fantastic. So, and then on Instagram, where can people find you? On Instagram, we are at reorigin underscore official. Okay, perfect. And those will be in the show notes for everyone listening. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. This was an uh, amazing conversation and thank you for sharing your story with everyone and all of your knowledge and passion with the world now. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Healer Revolution podcast. If you're enjoying what you're listening to, please do me a favor and like, subscribe, leave a comment, anything that can help get this information out to more people who may be struggling. You can also find me online at thehealerrevolution.com or amandapanacea.com. And you can also find me on Instagram at amandapanacea. Thank you so much for joining the revolution.